Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show here on the We Are Libertarians podcast network. It's so great to speak to you again today, and I'm very excited to bring to you one of my favorite libertarians, somebody that I have learned a tremendous amount from, whether she knows it or not. Uh, <laughs> and it is Mary Ruart, who is the author of Healing Our World, which in my opinion is like, if you're going to recommend one book, somebody says, I want to learn about libertarianism. This is a great book to start with. And thank you for joining me. But let me say that when I first read it in 2013, when I was marketing director for the Advocates for Self-Government, I had been kind of in a long, you know, like right libertarianism. I had come in through Ron Paul and read a lot of that stuff. And like, I had never heard libertarianism presented from a point of empathy and self growth in the way that you put it in this book. And it was very transformational for me. So thank you for writing the book. And maybe we start with that. I mean, what is your overall libertarian philosophy? And why do you look at it? How, how do you through what lens do you look at it? Well, there's several lens. Um, when I first was in college and read Ayn Rand's work, I was very impressed, but I also was concerned because at that point in time, I guess you could call me a liberal. So <laughs> I, and not the classical kind. <laughs> right, right. So um, what really transformed my idea of how libertarianism would work is that I had, I had two, two issues going around this helping other people. Um, you know, first of all, the compassionate business of helping the poor. Uh, the second one was I had been raised Catholic. I had gone to Catholic school most of my life. And the one thing I took away from that was that loving your neighbor as yourself could be a very productive philosophy um, because it, it uh, you know, just having goodwill towards others helps you have goodwill towards yourself and, and really elevates, I think, your consciousness. So I was excited about those two concepts. And when I put them together, what I realized was that if, if someone didn't want to help the poor, you know, maybe they were being selfish. But if I took a gun, put it to their head and told them, yes, you will be forced to help the poor, that that was, that was even worse. <laughs> that was beyond selfishness. So um, that helped me recognize that the non-aggression principle really was something that uh, needed to be honored because if you don't honor it, you're doing a much greater harm than anyone who might be selfishly keeping things to themselves. And then later on, when I was working with low income people because I was renting out low income apartments, I quickly realized that the welfare system, which I had thought probably did some good. I, I saw it totally backfire and, and actually encouraging people, especially people of color, to make very poor choices early in their, their lives. Uh, for example, I'd have young women come to me and say, I'm going to be able to rent an apartment from you very shortly because I'm pregnant. I'm going to drop out of high school. I'm going to get this big check every every uh, couple of weeks. Then, of course, it looked big for someone in high school. But when you have a child, it doesn't look so big. It doesn't take care of everything. And so these poor women would have a second child uh, because they would get more stipend and then a third child. And by the time they were 21, they realized they were going to be poor for the rest of their lives because the cutoff was three children. And so they wanted to go back to work, but they had no high school diploma. They, you know, had three children that needed child care. So unless they had a relative that would take the children while they were starting out in an entry level job, they, they were stuck forever in the poverty trap. And this was the majority of the welfare recipients that I worked with. And so I saw, saw how harmful it was. And this helped me understand that the non-aggression principle isn't just a great moral thing. It's something that works in the real world. When we use aggression as our means, <laughs> instead of getting the ends we imagine we get, you know, we get really something that's very harmful. 
And so that really changed my entire perspective. And, and I wanted to share that perspective because it's really a very, it, it takes us, I think, the next step in understanding libertarianism. It's not just about don't tread on me. It's about really making the world a better place for everyone. Just about everyone benefits, even if they don't realize it, <laughs> from a non-aggressive world. And that's what I wanted to share. That's a message of hope and love and compassion and really, I think, elevates the way we think about libertarianism and the non-aggression principle. Yeah, it's one that I'm, I'm deeply attracted to and helping marginalized people rise out of their situations. And, and that takes help. That takes other people you know, working alongside them to, to better their lives. And can, can you define the non-aggression principle? Because I'm sure there are some people listening who've never heard that term and aren't quite sure what it is. And you have a different term for it in your book that I think is an upgrade. What is the non-aggression principle? Well, I call it the good neighbor policy because basically it says that, uh, you know, we, we try very hard not to uh, practice any theft, physical force, or um, um, I guess you could say uh, <laughs> lying about others. And if we do that, then what we do is we try to make it right again. We try to restore our victims. And, you know, there are times when we might violate the non-aggression principle in an emergency situation or something, recognizing that restitution is the proper, um, you know, the proper way to handle that. And without that restitution part, the non-aggression principle uh, sitting alone as simply not, uh, you know, not aggressing against others can... Uh, can give us some kind of crazy things. Like one of the things I heard on the internet were people who said, well, if you were falling from a tall building and you hung on to someone's balcony and they came out and said, hey, this is my private property. I don't want you on my balcony. If you're a true libertarian, you'll fall to your death. Right. <laughs> right. And of course that's, you know, that's ridiculous. What you would do if somebody said that is you'd probably haul yourself up on the balcony and do whatever you could to save your life. But you, you know, you might expect to pay restitution as a trespasser, you know, and, uh, and of course, that's, that's the kind of, um, I guess, distortion, you might say, of the non-aggression principle that can happen if you don't recognize that restitution is an important balance to the front end of the non-aggression principle, which we usually uh, look at as not using physical force, fraud, or theft against others. Yeah, I think that is an important, I mean, some people are probably listening like, oh, what are these, a couple of hippies? They're just talking about, you know, pacifism, like people can just do whatever they want, and then you're just going to let them do it. There's consequences in a libertarian society, are there not? Oh, yes, very much so, you know, and, and this is what doesn't happen today. I mean, you know, if you and I were neighbors, we'd probably be practicing the non-aggression principle. You know, if I accidentally threw garbage on your lawn, I'd clean it up and make it right with you because we're neighbors, right? We want to get along. We don't want to have, we don't want to be at war. We don't want to be the Hatfields and McCoys. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's interesting when we interact group to group in our society, most of us don't realize it, but we throw that non-aggression principle right out the window. That good neighbor policy goes right out the window. And, and so we're willing to tax each other, regulate what someone can take even to save their lives and, and things of that nature. And it's really, it's really kind of crazy. And we know instinctively, I think, that the good neighbor policy or the non-aggression principle really works well on a one-to-one -one basis. So why would we think it wouldn't work group to group? And people generally say, well, you know, we need to have things like taxes and, and stuff to support our society. But in fact, everything can be provided without taxes. It's just that we've been told <laughs> in our government schools that that's not so. But in fact, one of the, one of the things I did in Healing Our Worlds is I started looking for some real life examples and I was very surprised to see that almost every aspect, if not every aspect of the libertarian philosophy or not aggression principle or good neighbor policy, however you want to think of it, has actually been tried in the real world and been quite successful. Somewhere in the real world at some point, 
uh, it has been tried. And this is very exciting because <laughs> if you have a philosophy and it doesn't work in the real world, then obviously it's not the philosophy that's going to help humankind survive and thrive. And that's the intent of any moral philosophy, because if you don't, if it doesn't encourage humankind to survive and thrive, then it does just the opposite <laughs> and destroys it. Of course, nobody wants that. Yeah, there's two ways really to look at libertarianism. There's the utilitarian view, which is what you're suggesting through the state and central planning doesn't work. Look at the FDA and the vaccine rollout and all in the, the testing and right. So there's that argument. But then there's the moral argument, which Marshall Fritz made so brilliantly. I know you were involved with the advocates for self-government and uh, his presentation on libertarianism is one of the best, which you can hear in the Liberty Explained podcast, where he talks about the morality of one-to-one -one exchanges doesn't change just because we vote on it or we take something from you. Well, we'll take your car, but we'll give you a bike. You know, uh, talk a little bit about extending morality from that one-to-one -one good neighbor policy into government and the morality of government itself. Yes. Well, of course, as you know, um, I am a firm believer that Morality and practicality are two sides of the same coins, they're inseparable. And so what we do with government is we, as I said, we throw the non-aggression principle out the window. So for example, if you were my neighbor and I went over to your house and asked you for money for my favorite charity and you said no, I'd probably say, well, maybe next time. And you know, we'd both be happy and, and uh, it would be fine. But what we do in actuality is we, aren't happy with that outcome uh, when we're working group to group. So we think if one group doesn't wanna to contribute to our favorite charity, we want to force them to do that. And that's where, we, where government comes in. We go and vote. And if the majority decides that the minority has to contribute to the majority's favorite charity, then it happens at gunpoint if necessary. And I say at gunpoint if necessary, because if you don't pay your taxes, uh, you know, you you eventually will find that government agents will come to your house or place of business and they will forcibly take what you haven't wanted to give voluntarily. And so we take turns being victims and aggressors depending on how we vote or maybe how our representatives vote depending on how you want to think of this. And so it kind of encourages a hate mentality, right? So. Um, so people who want to contribute to one charity feel that the people who don't do it voluntarily, you know, they're, they're selfish, they're scumbags, whatever. And, and we do this on almost every issue. We take turns being victims and aggressors. And this creates division in our, you know, political realm. And that's a very bad thing because then we see the kind of, uh, you know, we see a lot of divisiveness and we become enemies against each other instead of working together cooperatively and respecting each other's desire to put their hard-earned money in one place or another. Um, I hope you're okay. I'd like, I'd like to ask about Lee Wrights. Um, I noticed on your website, uh, ruart.com, w-r-u-w-a-r-t.com, uh, that you you keep Lee's memory alive, really, really always appreciated, even though I often occasionally disagreed with our Lee Wrights. Uh, and, and it reminded me when you said something, you know, that you're not at war with your neighbor. And when he ran against Gary Johnson in 2012, that was his, sl his slogan, I'm not at war. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit, A, about the man and then, and his importance to libertarianism, but then also not being at war with everyone over everything, because you're so right. The division that we feel today, we feel like we're at war with everyone. Even libertarians, fellow libertarians feel like they're at war with each other right now, you know, that, which is not uncommon. But I just, that, that idea of we don't have to agree, but we don't have to be at war is just really important and really resonates 10 years later. That's right. That's right. Well, and you know, Lee was very important in his home state of North Carolina. He really helped the movement. I remember there was a time when North Carolina had such horrible ballot access laws as 
we never thought North Carolina would ever have libertarians on the ballot. And then they decided in North Carolina that they would go ahead and try to overcome the huge <laughs> uh, ballot access signature requirement. And I think Lee was a major part of that. I think he actually headed it up. And that really put the North Carolina Libertarian Party on the ballot. And then of course, Lee was a great writer and uh, much of the material that you see on my website that came from his libertyforall.net um, website is you know, written by him. And so he decided to be my campaign manager when I ran for the presidential nomination in 2008. He was great. And then after that experience, he decided to run himself. And this I am not at war theme was very important because of course we were at war. The US was at war with just about everybody. It wasn't being talked about. And one of the things I think that Lee could be very proud of is that, and he was proud of it, is that he got the attention of Gary Johnson and really kind of pushed him to talk about that issue. And he and Gary were on very good terms. They did not beat each other up. <laughs> they were very respectful to each other. And after the debate, actually, Gary said, well, you know, my brother just called me and he said, you won the debate. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I admired Gary very much for being able to, um, you know, being able to be the kind of person that would admit something like that. And of course, I admired Lee because he actually was was really great on the debate stage and, and everywhere. In fact, he really activated a lot of people overseas, even just as, of course, Ron Paul did later in a, um, I guess I would say, yeah, of course, Ron Paul did, a, did more activation because he was, of course, more well known, but um, Lee did get inquiries and emails from overseas. And I, I thought that was wonderful. Yeah, a truly great guy. Definitely worth reading his his material over at ruart.com. Um, you've also written a book called Short Answers to Tough Questions. Um, and I have many, many copies, if you ever need some, because uh, when the advocates left uh, Indianapolis to go to California, they said, keep all that stuff. And so- Oh, really? Uh, I may pick you up on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so I kept a lot of it, including a lot of the tapes from the advocates, all the training tapes from the 80s and 90s. I got all that, and I post that on the Upward Libertarian Activism podcast feed. So like Marshall, and I think there's some of your training tapes, and Sharon Harris, and some of the- you know, these great people, we just spoke to Ken Bassan, who will be in a future episode about the advocates. Um, and that was published by the advocates, the short answers to tough questions. And it's a great many, uh, uh, you know, what are some of the common objections that you hear? I mean, obviously, but the roads, uh, you, you know, you've, you've written a book that breaks down some of those questions that new libertarians get stumped with. What are some of the questions that you tackle in there that are most commonly objected to by people who are learning about the philosophy for the first time? Well, of course, one of the biggies is won't the poor starve in a libertarian society because right. people think government isn't taking care of them, nobody is. And of course, the true answer is the poor would have more in a libertarian society uh, because as you see on the front cover of the recent edition of Healing Our World, one of the things I claim is that it enriches the poor, and it does. So that's that's really wonderful. Um, the other ones we get, the, one of the toughies for many libertarians are environmental questions. And I, I find that kind of interesting because really, if you think about it, if you get rid of sovereign immunity, you privatize land and beast, and you use restitution for po the, the pollution solution, everything falls into place environmentally. So really we have the answers to the environment and poverty, but it's a lot of libertarians don't understand that. And part of the reason is that um, we've been conditioned to think of wealth, for example, as a pie. But, and then of course you only have so many slices, but the reality is the pie can grow. <laughs> the wealth pie is not limited. It's basically unlimited. It's only limited when government gets involved. And of course, the knowledge base that we have at, at the particular time we're talking about. But the government truly interferes with wealth creation. And uh, that's 
of course, why there's a lot of poverty today. Most, in fact, I make the statement that most poverty in the world today, if not all, is caused by government. Well, I mean, government itself, the inhumanity of bureaucracy and the administrative state and government itself has been on full display. Uh, you know, just finished an interview with a small business owner in California talking about how much worse off his business is in California than it is than it would be in Indianapolis or if there weren't lockdowns at all, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's causing undue suffering to him and his employees. But there you know, I don't think that anything has exposed the complete lack of need for the FDA like coronavirus. <laughs> and when you look at, there's a great article that I always recommend to people in the New York Times called The Lost Month about the CDC and the FDA's failures at getting testing going. And that single-handedly led America to 400,000 deaths versus the 15,000 I think that Germany's had because they had testing early, South Korea. That's right. um, you've, written, you've written a book, Death by Regulation. You've been on the program. Patreon members can listen in the archives to that interview. Um, I mean, as you've watched as an author of a book about the, the inhumanity essentially of the FDA, as you watched the last year, what have you been thinking about? Well, basically you're right, the FDA, told us that we could only use the CDC's test. And they held that line for about six weeks. We couldn't import tests. Um, so the only tests we had were, <laughs> I'd say, bootlegged tests mm -hmm. that hospitals had ordered before the edict went out. And it turned out the CDC's test, of course, didn't work. <laughs> so, you know, both those uh, agencies get an F, in my opinion. Uh, for what they did, but the FDA also prohibited us from importing um, pr protective gear like masks or um, surgical gowns unless we were getting them from a supplier that already was in business supplying us. So basically, we had a situation where our healthcare workers were reusing disposable protective gear, which was crazy. And and then after that six weeks, the FDA. Um, let up on that. The other thing that they did is when all of the hand sanitizer went off the shelf, the whiskey distillers said, hey, we've got lots of alcohol. We can, we can make plenty of this stuff right away. And the FDA said, well, no, not exactly. If you don't put this poison into your ethanol products, because ethanol is a drinkable alcohol, somebody might drink the hand sanitizer. And the whiskey distiller said, yeah, but we might not be able to clean that out of our equipment later. We might have to get rid of our equipment and buy new. Well, the FDA didn't change their mind on that. And I did see some products floating around, which I suspect did not have the poison in them. But <laughs> who's going to drink hand sanitizer? I mean, really? Oh, well, um, we just, you know, in the example of the California, like, there's one barber who has, I mean, he said in Fresno, he hasn't been able to go get a legal haircut in a year almost. And so they've got, they've put up like these two-way mirrors. So you can't see that the, it looks like the business is closed, but if you were to enter the business and then you have to enter and exit the back door. So there's like bootleg haircuts going on in California, which, you know, as a Hoosier, I was like, oh man, you guys, no wonder everybody's really mad about the lockdowns out there. Like, it's just so... Like the, it's like censorship. If you look back, if your goal was to get rid of like the Alex Jones type thinking two years later, you certainly did a really poor job of it. Oh, yeah. Censorship, prohibition, central planning with the vaccine rollout, like it just always fails. It never works properly. Like the FDA is just a great example of well-intentioned government creating deadly, horrible results. Yes, and of course they really um, marginalized a lot of the treatments the doctors were finding that worked, like hydroxychloroquine taken early with zinc uh, was effective. And if, if we'd uh, if if that would have been publicized rather than suppressed, uh, I think a lot fewer people would have died or had serious side effects from the COVID. You know, this type of censorship is something we've not seen before, at least not in my 
career as a scientist. I just haven't seen that level of censorship before. And that's really scary because there are many, now we're, we're finding out there are many ways to treat uh, COVID and you know that could really save lives. And it's just really mind boggling that censorship has entered so much into the process, not just with the FDA and the CDC saying things and then changing the going like 180 degrees later, <laughs> uh, going to the opposite extreme. And, you know, this is the danger really. Um, when we have an FDA, for example, and people listen to what the FDA says, of course they believe that that must be true, right? Because the FDA is there to protect us. But the FDA is a political body, just like any other body, like Congress or, you know, the White House. And they they act politically. And when they act politically, uh, the truth is oftentimes, or scientific inquiry is oftentimes set aside. In, and uh, the political politically correct answer is, the one that's put out. So people do need to question. And my hope is that if they are aware of what the FDA did in these six weeks by preventing us from getting hand sanitizers, preventing our healthcare workers from getting protective clothing, and really preventing the whole nation from getting uh, testing, that they will realize that they need to evaluate everything that they hear from the FDA and CDC very carefully because these are political bodies. They are not what most people think, which are you know, protective bodies that are out for, looking out for our welfare. They're looking out for their own welfare. So final question, like as you watch you know, the world right now and uh, understand the world that libertarianism can create through harmony, peace and prosperity. I mean, if you had a microphone to every human being on earth, like, what would you say? Well, I would say, take the good neighbor policy that you practice on a one-to-one -one basis and start thinking about practicing it on a group-to-group -group basis because you practice it as individuals because you know it gives you harmony in your neighborhood and it increases your ability to you know, utilize your wealth in productive ways instead of having to defend yourself all the time like you would if you were in a feud like the Hatfields and McCoys. <laughs> so look towards government and see how when you interact group to group through that, we're actually, we're actually creating war and poverty. And we don't need to do that. Mary Ruart, thank you so much. Website again is ruart.com. Uh, books are Death by Regulation, Healing Our World, and Short Answers to Tough Questions. Be sure to go check out her website and support her and purchase these books. Uh, Healing Our World is a great gift for people who are kind of interested in libertarianism and want to know a little bit more. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thanks for doing this, Chris. Thanks for listening to The Chris Spangle Show. We will see you again very soon.